and equations. And I've chosen that, uh, first of all, because it's the very basics uh, to start, but also because it is uh, uh, not only uh, formalist for numerical relativity. In fact, it was not born for that. Um, it is uh, something that is in general useful to give, to, 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 um, to give the concept of energy in, uh, in general relativity, to give a Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity, and so on and so forth. So it's something that can be useful also for uh, the general education of someone that is working with uh, gravity. This is the plan. Um, I hope you can see the slide. Uh, let me make a last try. Uh, now, do you still see the slide or the slide show? It's still the, the slide. OK, Is then it? I give up. <laughs> um, and I use this. Uh, so there's, a, there's a, um, some material that you find uh, on numerical relativity. It's not, uh, there's not many books, I must say, and they are all relatively recent, but there are books. Um, so they are all listed uh, here at the beginning, especially also some uh, lecture note in blue. Um, and th this is a relatively recent book that uh, summarized the, uh, the key formulas for the field. Uh, also, if you, I will give you, I will pass you the slide later, but uh, uh, you will find a link, in, link them in the, in, in the school website. Uh, also, if you click here, uh, this is my numeric relativity course, the website. Um, and there you find uh, many, many resources. Uh, so that's why I just put the link there. Uh, in particular, you find the links to the most relevant, in my opinion, methodological papers and many reviews, um, and uh, also other web resources and even uh, public quotes and so on. You find also my lecture notes, mm. uh, which are basically a summary of um, uh, Baumgart and Guguillon uh, blue notes that you find on top. So nothing really original, but uh, on those lines. Um, so so I'll, I'll, I'll simply uh, skip many references today, and uh, especially tomorrow, I will not give many references, but you'll find everything uh, at this website and, and in these books, basically. And uh, well, as an, as an invitation before starting, if, if you if you want to know more about numerical relativity, if you want to have a deeper uh, um, uh, opinion, or uh, uh, yeah, if you want to have uh, something more, uh, I'm starting in these days an online uh, uh, numerical relativity, my online <laughs> numerical relativity course here at, at Jena. And so uh, since it's online, uh, you, if you want to join, uh, just write me. Okay, so numerical relativity, this is my one slide on numerical relativity. As I mentioned before, um, it's the art of solving Einstein equation on a computer. And uh, in fact, if you want to do uh, a numerical relativity, um, you have to know different things, let's say. And these are the fourth pillar uh, uh, on top of which the field builds. Um, so let me comment on each of them. Um, so the first thing that you want to do um, is to find a suitable formulation of, uh, of general relativity, OK? Uh, if you want to solve equation, you, you, we know how to solve the partial differential equations. Uh, general relativity is not directly written in that way. Uh, so the first thing that one needs to think is uh, um, to put those equations, uh, covariant equation, into the form of PDEs. Um, and in particular, to define some uh, well-posed mathematical problem that could be a Cauchy problem, or in fact, it is not a simple Cauchy problem, as we will discuss, but um, to find a general strategy on how to approach uh, this equation. Uh, so this is mostly a mathematical relativity problem. <clears throat> um, and then on the, on the right, top right, uh, you need to think about coordinate and singularity in the sense that uh, um, if you want to solve on a computer sp some space time of interest, uh, um, like black holes, for example, uh, uh, you need to think hard uh, what you want to do uh, and how you want to do it. So of course, a computer cannot deal with, uh, uh, with singularities. Um, and in general, a computer cannot even deal with horizons. 
automatically, let's say. Uh, so you need to think hard uh, how to how, how to um, set up uh, your coordinate system that you use for the numerical integration. Uh, in particular, in view of the fact that singularities can form, black hole can form, black hole can move, and so on and so forth. Obviously, here uh, there's mathematical analysis inside, but there's also um, what I mentioned before, the, the art of it. So uh, in, in some cases, you really need to invent um, singularity and, uh, sorry, coordinates, engage condition that allows you to do these um, computer integrations. Uh, and there's, there's, no, there's nobody that uh, uh, can, can prescribe it for you. There's no, there's no theory about that, except um, some um, generic heuristic principle that tells you. Singularity, singularity should be avoided, for example, on a computer. And we will see, we will see an example of that, uh, a sort of Gedanken simulations. Um, a third top uh, left um, is about numerical methods. So um, you need to be an expert if you want to do numerical relativity of solving PDEs. And uh, the reason is that uh, um, um, the PDEs that we often have are rather complicated with respect to the, um, so they the are Einstein equations. And they are rather complicated with respect to what find in say computational physics book. Um, so in some cases, these numerical methods are, are borrowed from computational fluid dynamics, from com computational physics literature. <clears throat> but in other cases, you, you simply stumble on a, on a set of equation, elliptic, nonlinear elliptic equation. Or, or, or system complicated PD system like that, uh, for which in general there's no um, known method, and so you have to invent a bit um, your own method to solve uh, these PDs. Um, you also need to um, do these things uh, to uh, solve, you know, important problems. And important problems in general are. Uh, geometrically complicated, there could be two black holes coll colliding, for example, so without symmetries, for example, that's why you use numerical methods. Um, and so this has to be done with uh, uh, dedicated method, uh, for instance, uh, uh, adaptive, complicated adaptive 3D grids and high performance computing, which is um, absolutely necessary to reach the, the resolution that are required for these computations. Um, remember that what we want to solve, our, the solution that we want to have is an entire portion of the space-time. It's not all of it, but it's a large portion of a four-dimensional space-time with matter field inside. So uh, this is a problem that requires uh, uh, high-performance computing. Uh, just to anticipate some results, maybe the result, <laughs> Um, this is the holy grail of numerical relativity for many years since the field started. What people tried to do <coughs> was to um, solve these collisions. Uh, the, the general relativistic problem in some sense, the general relativistic extension of the Kepler, of the Kepler problem, that differently from Newton is, uh, is very complicated here. And uh, this is the first uh, attempt the first, uh, not, not the first, sorry, not the first attempt, but the first success uh, by Franz Pretorius in 2005. Uh, what he did, he precisely managed to um, uh, re resolve on the computer a full uh, circular orbit, the plunge of the two, um, the, the merger of the two holes, and uh, uh, the final black hole with this with this perturbed uh, space-time around. And here you see the, the orbit, which don't mean much, but gives you an idea of um, what has been, uh, has been solved. And here on the left, you see the, uh, the gravitational waveform that has been computed for the first time uh, through the whole process. So um, what this result I highlighted is a smooth transition between um, the spiral, the so-called spiral waveform, which is the, the, the emission from the orbital phase, um, the merger, which roughly happens at the peak, at, at the maximum amplitude of this wave, and the ring down, which instead describes the signal from a, per, a perturbable cold. It's known from perturbation theory of, um, of, of 
black holes. So I strongly recommend to read this paper. It's a physical review letter. It's very short. It's very readable. Um, in particular, maybe it's too small here, but uh, in the second column, um, it summarized in, in eight points, uh, essentially all the technical uh, and, 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 uh, and physical difficulties um, that I had in my previous slide. So for example, in point one, he, he mentioned a formulation of the field equation based on harmonic coordinate. This is, this is, this is very important because in this, in this coordinate, um, the, the, the Cauchy problem in GR is well posed. And then he talks about the discretization scheme. Um, uh, yeah, he talks about the specific discret discretization scheme that he used on numerical methods, use of compactified coordinate where the outer boundary are, um, um, are at special infinity. So again, here the problem of uh, the mesh covering the, the, the space time. Uh, use of adaptive mesh refinement to adequately resolve the relevant scales. Um, dynamical excision that tracks the motion of the black holes through the grid. So this is very important. The, 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 this is the, the one of the solution to the problem of avoiding singularities that I mentioned before. Um, a few other technical aspects. And uh, um, again, uh, time slicing that slow down the collapse of, of the lapse. This is again about gauge. Um, and finally, number eight, the collision, the, the, the addition of constraint damping terms to the field equation, which is very important um, uh, to maintain in some sense the equation, equation well posed. So I, I, strongly rec I, I strongly recommend to read to read this paper. It's, it's very nice to read. It's not, of course, the, the first paper. Uh, there has been attempts since many years before, and there has been attempt, there has been work since then, uh, even to improve the precision of this. Um, of this calculation. <clears throat> Just to give you some flavor, these are two uh, rather uh, old papers, uh, not the very first, but uh, I think the second. Um, so on the left, uh, it is a very long paper I won't comment about, but uh, uh, it's about calculating the, the, the head-on collision of two black holes. And the first uh, is by Larry Smart. This is actually his PhD thesis, 1976, I think. Um, where he laid down the theoretical framework, but there's no simulation published. The simulation are in his thesis. Um, and then the, 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 the follow-up of this work, it's 1st November 1993, okay? Um, and here is where simulation are shown. So this just gives you a flavor of the difficulty uh, of, of doing that, of doing that problem. Uh, and about the findings, uh, of course, there were <clears throat> other people that tried to attempt um, to, to predict what would happen in this, in this collision and what the, um, the gravitational wave would be. Um, so there's this famous cartoon by uh, Kipton Group, in which it says basically, yeah, we know from post-Newtonian theory uh, the signal that we expect from the spiral phase or the orbital phase. We know from perturbation theory of black hole, the signal that we would expect from the ring down. What we don't know is what happens in between, and this really needs supercomputer simulations, 98, for example. Uh, in the same year, uh, uh, other people, particularly the Moore, the Moore team, say, yes, we know before, we know afterwards. Uh, why don't we assume continuity and, uh, and try to predict um, um, what the signal, what the signal would be, and they predicted this kind of um, strain shape, this morphology of the waveform, and that's precisely what uh, uh, then Pretorius and other found in, uh, in simulation, at least qualitatively. You see a difference between these two plots, just because what uh, is plotted in, Pre in Pretorius um, paper is uh, is the second derivative of this quantity, so it's the vice, it's the vice color, not directly h, and of course. Uh, well, later, uh, Nature gave us the answer, and uh, uh, the answer is incredibly close to, uh, well, it's precisely what uh, uh, was predicted by Einstein, so precisely what predicted by, <coughs> by numerical relativity simulation. Um, so nowadays, simulation are very, uh, are very advanced. Um, let me try to show this. Uh, um, 
Numerical relativists are very fond of their simulations. Uh, so let me try to, and they make, and they make movie about those. Um, so um, you find many on YouTube. This is a nice one. Um, so now you should see, this is a modern simulation now from the SXS collaboration. Um, what you see are the horizon uh, of the two black holes. In color code, you see the lapse function, uh, which basically is a measure of, uh, um, in some sense, it's a measure of the, of the gravitational uh, potential. Uh, and you see, uh, you will see many, many revolution. And in, at, the, at the bottom, you see the, the complete gravitational wave calculated far away uh, from the source, but still in the same simulation, okay? Um, and you see, this is the spiral. Um, there is an acceleration. Uh, the bodies gets closer and closer. The frequency gets higher, and they finally merge. There's one horizon here now. And uh, this final care black hole is uh, ringing down to to, um, to care actually. And you see this oscillation there mirrors than what you see in the in the wave from far extracted very far away from from the source okay let me try to go back Here. oops sorry here okay sorry the youtube continue <laughs> um Okay, and that's precisely what uh, uh, basically in, in 2015, um, when uh, a signal was detected, this is basically the signal from LIGO interferometers. It's essentially un, um, untreated, it's essentially un, unfiltered. There's a very, very simple filter to do uh, to reach uh, to see this. And you see immediately that uh, um, it is precisely what uh, it has been. Um, it has been predicted before. Um, so a couple of slides about uh, what is this waveform. I think I am the first talking about uh, in this training sessions. So probably it's the first time that you hear this, maybe not. Um, essentially, as I mentioned before, this, this, this typical signal uh, is roughly, can be roughly understood, at least qualitatively, uh, by, three, by three phases. Um, so there's a, there's, an, there's, there's a typical chirp-like signal in which amplitude and frequency gets larger and larger um, that is known from the, from the post-Newtonian approach to the two-body problem. Uh, this was actually first calculated by Dyson, uh, the same of the Dyson series, uh, following up an exercise in landau lifshitz uh, and he predicted that uh, uh, the, the, the mass, although gravitational waves are very tiny, and uh, especially in, 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 um, in post-Newtonian theory, um, by the time of the collision, um, there must be an intense flash of, uh, of gravitational wave, a burst of it, okay? So this was the, the first prediction. This cannot be predicted in, in post-Newtonian technique because their things are um, exploding. Um, but uh, if you do the calculation and you have some uh, uh, imagination or you, you want to make a prediction, you might predict that. And that was done. Uh, and this is well described. Um, then there's the part that, you know, keep on saying we need uh, uh, numerical relativity and turns out to be a continuous um, development of the chirp, of the chirp-like signal that reaches a maximum. That's the burst predicted by Tyson. <clears throat> and after that, it, it is continually connected to uh, the ring down phase, which is instead known from, from, from the cold perturbation theory, from the work of Chandrasek and, 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 and others. And you, I think people will tell you um, exactly what this formula means. But, um, I won't. Uh, there's, in, there's an interesting uh, um, short interview uh, to Professor Vishyeshvara, who uh, lived long enough to uh, see the first gravitational wave. Um, so this Shweshvara was in some sense the first, one of the first numerical relativists in the sense that uh, um, 
uh, he describes here in red what uh, what he what he did. It was a natural question to ask uh, how does one see a black hole. So using a computer, he says, I scatter packets of gravitational wave from a black hole and observe that this quasi-normal mode, so this typical oscillation here of a, of a perturbed black hole, emerge and carry the signature of the black hole, so its mass and its speed, for example. This was theoretical. I never dreamed that I could I could I could see it one day. And uh, uh, so, in some sense, this is one of the first uh, numerical relativity experiment, pre-numerical relativity experiment that they, that, that existed, and it's quite amazing that they did it in a period where um, you know not everybody would agree that uh, black holes are astrophysical objects. And following up, there's a very huge literature. Perhaps this is the next um, the next step. Uh, the, the paper of uh, Reggie Wheeler and uh, um, about the stability of a black hole. Of course, perturbation theory is also important for, for that. So as I mentioned, these things uh, are, can be considered numerical relativity precursors. So the left here is, is, is the result of the numerical experiment of, of Ishveshvara, uh, in which he scatters gravitational pa packages um, on, the, on the spatial black hole potential and observe this ring down that is the same that is uh, uh, that seen also in binary black hole, and then perhaps the other the other precursor is um, <clears throat> this work by uh, Davis, Ruffini, and Tionno, <clears throat> a couple of years later, in which um, instead of scattering waves, they use a point, they use a test mass and throw uh, and, and do a net collision between a test mass and a, and a, and a black hole. This is an experiment that uh, you in every general relativity class uh, you read something about it. Um, and the world calculates the the, uh, the the upper limit on the gravitational wave energy, for example, this way. Um, and here was done was done here again the, with the numerical experiment. And if you look at the top right, um, you see again precisely the signal is very similar to the signal of uh, of Vishesvara. The particle gets in, um, passes the horizon, get, uh, uh, but there is a pulse of gravitational wave with its um, um, Quasi normal mode oscillation of the um, of the black hole that are very evident here, exactly as here. So it's a it's a quite generic feature in some sense. And it's it's a signature of, of, of the black hole. Um, going to uh, uh, more modern things or uh, slightly post Pretorius breakthrough. <clears throat> this was a, a sort of surprise as well. Um, uh, so a gravitational wave transport uh, energy, mm -hmm. angular momentum, but also linear momentum, especially if the masses are um, um, are, are different one from the other uh, in, in, the, in the black hole collision, or if the spins are with particular configuration, um, uh, in some particular processing configuration, this um, this uh, emission of linear momentum is, is significant. And uh, uh, this and uh, this uh, translates to the fact that uh, uh, when they merge, uh, the final black hole for just for momentum conservation gets a kick. Okay, um, and uh, this can be predicted also in, in simpler terms. But the, what really numerical relativity predicted is that uh, these kicks in some configuration can can be enormous. Um, and so, for instance, this particular simulation predicted 2,000 kilometers per second. So this means that the black hole is formed from other two, and it's kicked out uh, from the galaxy, from the host galaxy, uh, just by, by, by this effect. So um, here you see uh, before, of course, uh, measuring gravitational wave, but um, you see this, the astrophysical importance of uh, uh, binary black hole collision from from numerical relativity. What kind of quantitative uh, prediction can can give? Um, one of the things that uh, uh, one has to do with uh, with numerical in numerical relativity simulation is, um, you know, to 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 um, to calculate, uh, for example, the horizon. Tell uh, where the uh, where the black holes are that that's what finishes what that 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 was defines the black hole um but if you think about the the concept of event horizon as we studied 
um, where you see that if you want to if you want to calculate that, it's a global concept. So you need um, you need to calculate the entire space time, um, and then in some sense trace back light rays um, in time. Um, but that's exactly the opposite of what of what happens in in, in a simulation. In a simulation, you start from a given space, actually a slice of the space, we will define what this is, um, and then integrate forwards in time. And so this means that if you really want to compute an event horizon, you can't in, in, a, in, a, in a simulation, because you, you don't have the future yet. Um, and so one way, perhaps, you know, uh, one way uh, or the way that we have to <coughs> um, identify black holes in a simulation so these these black balls that were in this in these videos before um, is not to use an event horizon but to use an apparent horizon which is um, um, which is a local concept in some sense um, it's uh, it's defined on these uh, um, hypersurfaces that uh, are then integrated in time and so it can be defined at, at every um, at every time step and again, this is a concept that is in common with uh, many other um, uh, fields uh, that deals uh, that, that that deals with 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 gravity. Mm -hmm. um. <clears throat> so numerical relativity, numerical relativity is also um, concerned with also concerned with not only with vacuum space time, um, but people also worked in uh, with matter space time and perhaps uh, this is uh, not perhaps this is the first simulation um by masaru shibata of two binary neutron stars uh colliding and also in this case um this paper is much more um it's much more longer than than, than pretorius but um, you can certainly read it um and also in this case you know gravitational wave have been predicted here, the addition, of course, is is the is the is the um, is the matter is the matter terms as the matter fields that needs um, sort of technology similar to um, other astrophysical other astrophysical problem with um, hydrodynamics and numerical methods that are um, um, that can solve both metric and and matter equation of motions. And also in this case, since uh, 2000, the fields has enormously advanced. Um, and more recently, uh, especially after um, the binary neutron star detection of 2017, that people were already there, um, these numerical relativity uh, simulations are absolutely necessary <clears throat> to understand some of the um you know some of the astrophysics that is that is behind uh, that is behind this object so um is in some sense hidden but uh, um for instance you might have heard about the kilonova about uh, these um electromagnetic emission associated to the um um the the building of the um of the heavy elements in the, through the R process that happens precisely in some um, dynamical in some in some ejecta in some material that is ejected during during merger. Well, to to calculate precisely the condition where this happens, which are which are critical, uh, you need general relativity. In other terms, if you do numeric, if you do Newtonian simulation, you get different thermodynamical condition because you get you have less gravity. You have um, uh, weaker, weaker shocks. You have um, at the collision. You have <coughs> equation of state that are um, not suitable, not properly describing the neutron stars. So it's it's somehow hidden, but uh, uh, it's implicit. But uh, um, it's really it's really important to have quantitative quantitative astrophysics prediction predictions of certain of certain aspect. So I'll show you again um, one of these simulations. You see basically the same as no. Wait. You see basically the same as the other with the uh, difference that you see the matter fields here. Uh, here. Okay. 
So at the bottom, you, you, see, the, you see the gravitational wave. Um, and in blue, this is not anymore the, 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 the apparent horizon, but uh, it's now the, the, the fluid compo composing the, the two neutron stars. <clears throat> and in, in, in yellow, again, it's a curvature of space time, essentially so some scalar field that indicate that. And here you see these this violet things uh, that uh, have been uh, expelled um, here. Um, so this is matter that is expelled by the by the outer layer of the <clears throat> of the of the two star colliding, uh, and this is, is matter that actually gets unbound, um, so flies away and cools down, and it's neutron rich, and this creates this uh, condition for their process uh, nucleosynthesis which can, can, can only, uh, for certain element, can only be produced in at this neutron-rich condition here. And differently from the other, you see that you don't have immediately a black hole. Um, in this case, you have uh, um, um, a dense, a dense, uh, dense core of a, whatever remnant neutron star uh, and with around a sort of, of, of disk. Um, and this can continue. There can be black hole at some point formed by gravitational collapse, uh, but it could also be a star. Uh, um, here, there's black hole formation. Just a second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's instead the apparent horizon. With, with, and you have a, a black hole plus a accretion, accretion disk. Um, so, in general, um, uh, in, in general, um, uh, we don't know yet how to uh, how, we don't know how to predict precisely um, if there will be a black hole or a neutron star. This is just a qualitative um, criterion for the moment. Um, okay, more results from numerical relativity. Um, in ninety three. Uh, Chopwick uh, put out this very interesting paper. Again, I suggested to read it. It's a physical review letter, very short, very well written. <clears throat> and uh, uh, essentially started an entire, an entire subfield, I would say. Um, so what he did was to consider um, scalar fields, in general relativity, the propagation of scalar fields. And um, and he set up an entire uh, one, one, one parameter family of, of, of initial data, where this parameter is, for example, the intensity of the scalar field, the energy of the scalar field, on top of Minkowski space time, just to start. <clears throat> and, and then, of course, he can uh, he could, he could tune um, to put more or less energy in the, in, in the, scalar, in the scalar field. And, and well, what he discovered is that uh, uh, if, 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 if the energy was, was small, um, the scalar field would simply disper disperse and behave exactly as a as a as a, as a linear wave equation, <clears throat> as a, a, yeah, behave and, and have a linear dispersion uh, like you would expect from from a wave equation, but of course with full nonlinear uh, equations. Um, however, um, increasing the the energy of the initial field uh, and increasing say a lot. Um, what, it, what, uh, what you would find is that uh, there's, there's too much energy that creates curvature and eventually forms a black hole. Okay? Um, and so the way this black hole forms um, uh, happens, um, uh, happens in an analogous way to what critical phenomena in statistical mechanics happen. Um, so there's a power, there's a power law around the, around the threshold formation. So there's a threshold, there's a black hole threshold formation. Uh, it's not kind of um, continuum thing. Um, uh, there's a there's a black hole formation threshold. There's a there's a power law, typical you know power law with universal exponent. And around this threshold, the um, the um, the solution is actually self self similar. So this is what uh, happened. This is what's described here in this first plot. This is x is any quantity, any metric quantity, and rho is the is the radius. So if you take a certain profile close to the threshold, x of rho, at a certain time, um, and you scale it 
in space time. So if you go to look at rho minus an universal constant, T minus a universal constant, um, you, you find the self you find a self similar solution. So this is a this is a an, a, 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 and these are a, a universal constants uh, for the scalar, for the scalar field. Um, they are different if you uh, consider other type of, of, of matter. And so this started an entire an entire field basically. Um, this observation and people looked in detail into um, this um, phenomenology of the gravitational collapse. Immediately after uh, Chalkwick, there was this uh, paper by Abrams and Evans uh, that showed that you actually don't need a, a matter to see to see this. Uh, so if you start from a certain particular type of um, of initial data that contains gravitational wave. Um, so you have to go into D for that, but um, uh, again, increasing some para increasing the, the, in some sense the gravitational wave content in, through some parameter, you will also find a very 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 similar phenomenology, of course, with different with different uh, um, uh, universal constant in that case. Um, but essentially, it, it seems a really property of uh, of um, uh, of the space time and the, on, of the uh, on, and of mm -hmm. uh, gravitational collapse, and yeah, there are these two reviews if you are interested. <clears throat> uh, a last, uh, uh, yeah, a last uh, example. Um, this is work by various group. Um, here on the left is paper by Lenner and Pretorius, and uh, on the right is um, a paper by Figueras group. Um, what these people tried to do uh, was to look at the uh, um, whole type of solutions in, in higher dimensions. And uh, um, differently from, you know, our spatial shield black hole, um, if you go to um, uh, higher dimension, uh, what you find is that uh, a small perturbation from this equilibrium solution um, are, su are subject to instabilities. Uh, and so the natural question is, okay, what happens uh, uh, if there is a small, if there is a small perturbation and what's, what's the next, um, uh, what's, what's the next solutions, right? Where, where you, where this uh, space time goes. Um, and so in particular, um, what uh, Lenner and Pretorius considered here um, is a 5D black string solution and I have the last movie, hopefully. Uh, and I want to show you this one, yep. And there it is. Um, so it's 5D, but uh, it's, a, it's a 3D simulation. Um, uh, so it, in some sense, it's very symmetric. Okay, and you start with, um, so what you see, so yeah, I found it on the web only here, so. Um, um, so what you see here is the initial solution and, um, and it says it's an embedding diagram. So um, you're basically seeing horizons uh, here. Uh, and you see that it's unstable. This, this, this type of instability that is also known from uh, viscous fluids. Um, and where it goes, it goes to a solution in which you have two black holes connected, which are these two balls uh, co connected by 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 this by the string. Uh, though, of course, this string is still unstable, right? Because it was stable, unstable at the beginning, so it is unstable. So what this determines um, is, again, one of these uh, self-similar um, solutions in which the string gets unstable again. Uh, it forms again a black hole and uh, connected by, by two strings. And then two strings are again unstable, and so on and so forth. So you get this type of, um, of, of self-similar solution in, in this sense. And the, the crucial finding here was that uh, um, with, within this process, uh, 
um, you, you, you don't continue uh, in it for an infinite time, but at the finite time, you actually arrive at the, at the uh, here at the naked singularities. And so it was a way of, it was one of the solution that naturally um, violates uh, cosmic censorship. Um, this is another type of, 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 of problems. Um, it's a black ring in 5D as well, I think. Um, and but the, but the phenomenology is very similar. So the ring get, gets unstable. Oops, and uh, the ring gets unstable. Um, you form black holes. Uh, sorry, you form black holes uh, again connected by um, by strings. In the, in, in the second in the second uh, case, it's interesting because um, uh, they did it in um, in asymptotically flat space time. So, it, of course, they could not push the simulation uh, too far, but uh, um, it could be um, another another example of. Uh, by cosmic censorship violation in asymptotically flat space time. So this is just to show you that um, you know it's not it's not only about black hole collision. Um, uh, it's not only about astrophysics. Uh, there are also um, interesting uh, interesting phenomena that can be uh, theoretical and, and theoretical aspect that can be uh, that can be studied with, uh, with numerical relativity. So I think I've given enough <laughs> examples. Um, and I want to start the last part. I think it will take less than half an hour. Um, and I will um, briefly summarize here the formalis that, that, that we will deal. Uh, just a second, you understand that? Yeah, I, I think that uh, I will give you in the next three slides shortly a summary of what we will discuss more tomorrow. Maybe a little bit better at the equations and so on. Um, and then uh, I want to give you one of these examples, um, how, how do we, do we deal with singularities in, in the numerical evolution. But first of all, I have to start from here. <clears throat> uh, so how do we set up? Um, an initial value problem or a Cauchy problem in uh, in general relativity, where the, the, the first step is um, to define a uh, sort of time, right? And to solve a Cauchy problem, we need a narrow of time. Um, and so we need to restrict essentially to uh, po all the possible solution for the space time. We need to restrict to a class, which is called globally hyperbolic space time. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely the class that allows us to, uh, to define uh, uh, an, an arrow of time or, or, or a vector field that we can identify with time and foliate the four dimensional manifold into um, a time direction and orthogonal to that uh, th three dimensional hypersurfaces uh, that, we, that we call uh, sigma in this case. Um, and this is for example, what has been done by uh, in the ADM formulation is, is the same, is that thing. And so the basic variable of this problem uh, become the metric induced on the um, hyper, um, hyper surfaces, sigma, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the extrinsic curvature, which I'll, I'll talk immediately about it. Uh, and then they all, um, um, yeah, the, 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 the whole problem is simply a problem of, of time development of, of, a, of one of these hypersurfaces. So for those that are not familiar to the concept of it, this is the, to the concept of extrinsic curvature. So um, uh, I want to briefly summarize it. So this is just a, just a geometrical concept. It has nothing to do with, uh, with the general relativity. But essentially in this context, um, if you have um, if you have an hypersurface that is determined by its uh, um, by its normal vector n, it is embedded in in a larger manifold that is and that is uh, um, 
orthogon of, yeah, the, the, uh, so sigma is embedded in M, sigma is embedded in a larger manifold, and it is defined by this, by this perpendicular vector N. Um, you can still ask yourself, okay, how sigma uh, is bent in M? Okay, so this is a different question than asking um, the curvature of sigma. You are asking how the sigma is bent into a, into, uh, in, into the into the ambient manifold, and if you want an example of that, uh, you can think about the the, um, the cylindrum in R three. Okay, you take a, a cylinder in R three, uh, so the the the, the, um, the cylinder as as a surface as an as an intrinsic curvature which is zero because you can open the cylinder and you have a plane. Um, but as, as embedded in R3, it has a curvature which is related to, to, to the cylinder radius. Okay, so these are two different concepts. Um, and so that's what the extensive curvature measure. So it basically tells you how this, ve this uh, vector normal n changes uh, once it is trans transported uh, um, by a vector uh, that, that, is, that is tangent to sigma. Okay, <clears throat> and in particular, the trace of this um, of this um, extrinsic curvature is simply the expansion of the word lines defined by n, and these are called Eulerian observer. Okay, when we when we solve numerically Einstein equation in D three plus one, our um, our, uh, our numerical our, our numerical uh, observer are these Eulerian observer. And that's the way you define the Cauchy problem in GR. So you make this three plus one decomposition. You prom instead of the metric, you essentially promote the three metric and the extrinsic curvature, which is, which can be also interpreted as the velocity, in some sense of this three metric. Um, and and you project Einstein equation uh, into this um, direction, perpendicular and along n. And this gives you a natural way of, of defining a Cauchy problem. What you find is summarized here in the blue and green equations. So you find that uh, some equations uh, um, are defined only in a, in a, hyper, in a 3D hypersurface sigma. And these are, these are the constraints equation. Okay, essentially, it's related to the Bianchi identity. It's a, the fact that there are constraints is a general property, but here you see very clearly. Um, and you have an Hamiltonian constraint and, 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 a, and, a, and a momentum constraint. Uh, and everything, as I said, is just defined on, on one sigma. So there's nothing that relates one sigma to the other in these two. You see here is um, the reach, the intrinsic reach of the sigma uh, and, the, and the extrinsic curvature on sigma, and below it's the, the, the spatial divergence of the um, of the um, of the extrinsic curvature. So, so everything is, is spatial. There's no time derivative in any sense. Um, and the other, so these are the constraint equations. If you think about electromagnetism, you have constraint also there, and these constraints are essentially the divergence of B. So this play this this green block plays play the same role, okay. A better analogy is with the vector potential, but um, uh, and and then you you have dynamical equation, okay. And these are the blue. So the dynamical equation are essentially the, the lead derivative with respect to this normal direction to the hypersurfaces of the fundamental variable of the metric and of kappa. And you see that the, the, this time, this time, let, let me call it just time derivative for sake of simplicity. This time derivative of the metric is nothing else that uh, um, that kappa, the extrinsic curvature. So this is nothing else than the kinematical equation. In fact, this equation here is not uh, Einstein. It's not the, it, it, it's not derived from Einstein equation. This is just the geometry. So, and, and just reflect the fact that you can see the extrinsic curvature as the velocity of this metric, of, of the three metric, okay? Where GR enters is the second equation. 
this is really the, the time derivative of kappa. So it, it, it's what gives you the acceleration, okay? Um, and it contains the Ricci and, and, and many other quantities. <clears throat> um, but but in, in some, in some um, with some correct man manipulation, essentially this um, equation, the second blue equation um, reduces uh, in the weak limit to the to the um, to the Poisson equation for um, uh, for the gravitational Newtonian potential. Okay, and so you see that uh, with this approach that uh, we will see a bit more in detail tomorrow. Um, with with, each, with with this approach, you essentially have um, constraints that define solution on sigma. Uh, and, the, and the solution of this problem is called the initial data problem. It's a rather complicated problem, even more than evolution, in my opinion. Um, one reason is that you have four equations um, for, uh, for 12 unknowns. So um, you have more, um, yeah, it, 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 you have more unknown than, 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 uh, than equation. This means you have to make a choice of uh, or you have a you, you have a freedom of choosing data on this hyper, hypersurfaces, and after that uh, you have to make an answer, and after that you have to constrain only four degrees of freedom using using the equation. And obviously, the next question is how you do it. Um, you cannot choose arbitrarily. Uh, uh, for, uh, so, sorry, sorry, you cannot choose arbitrarily a certain number of, 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 of metric field components and just constrain the other because physically it doesn't mean anything. So you need a, you need a, you need a way to understand what you, cons what, you, uh, const what you want to constrain and what you want to solve or what you want to specify to prescribe in order to have physically motivated initial slices. So, so for example, you, you, you need to understand how to specify the, the gravitational wave content. From this variable, you need to you need to understand how um, you can create some astrophysically well motivated uh, initial data, and this is completely non-trivial. And even even if you would know how to do that, if you write down this equation carefully, you see that they are very complex um, system of uh, nonlinear elliptic PDs, um, for which there's barely uh, mathematic. There are very very few mathematical results. And so one needs to also make this this um, um, free data choice, uh, all, not only on a, on a physical basis, but also on a mathematical basis, in order to reduce yourself to the equation that you can solve. And then assume that uh, you have uh, you have been able to specify the the three metric on these hypersurfaces and the extrinsic curvature. Uh, you still want to evolve them and, you know, um, at their time development, which defines the space time. And well, the first question from electromagnetism would say, okay, but uh, are these constraints transported along this evolution? And uh, the answer is non-trivial, but is yes. Um, it's non-trivial to prove, but is yes. Tomorrow we will see a simple proof, proof of actually of that. Um, but yes, it works exactly as electromagnetism. So if you're guaranteed that if you solve the constraint at the say initial slide e equals zero, um, then you are allowed to solve uh, only the, the dynamical equation uh, for t lar larger than zero and, uh, um, and uh, at the continuum at least, your constraint will be solved for any t. Uh, and of course, the, the moment that you want to uh, um, evolve a Cauchy problem in time, you have to um, ask yourself if the, if the Cauchy problem itself is well posed. Um, and we will see something about tomorrow in detail about, about that. Uh, so well posed, well posedness here does not only refer to these two equations. It refers, of course, also to the matter equation eventually that you want to couple to them and also to the gauge. So here, um, there are quantities. Um, uh, let's, let me go. Okay, just, just a short comment, then tomorrow we see it better. Um, here, there are quantities that are called alpha and beta. They are called laps and shift vector, laps function and shift, shift vector. Um, 
of course you don't lose uh, you don't lose um, covariance the moment you do this three plus one decomposition so your gauge freedom must uh, enter in a, in, in, a, in a way right it enters it enters precisely through these four functions that essentially define the how um, a point evolves from one t to the next t so essentially this lapse function is, as the name says, the, the, the lapse, the, the proper, connects the proper time of an observer along this uh, normal vector. And the shift function is that is a special vector that essentially gives you the, the um, um, in a certain sense, the freedom here uh, of this, um, of this coordinate here on top of, uh, on top of the, of the sigma. So going back, <clears throat> the well posedness of uh, um, of the Cauchy problem is not only related to these blue equations, um, but also to the equation that you specify on top of those for the lapse and shift, that often are equation, are differential equation, not just a, you can prescribe them, of course, but often in the most useful cases they are just equations. So for uh, harmonic gauge, for example, they are equation. They are wave-like equations. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, also the well poseness of the matter equation, that in some sense, it's, it's simple, you know, simple matter uh, fields. So we will discuss uh, this in detail about tomorrow. And the last topic that I wanted to discuss in the last 10-15 uh, minutes is precisely uh, the gauge. <clears throat> so I tell you that we, we have to make gate choices and coordinate choices. And this goes back also to my very first slide um, about, uh, you know, having clever gauge that uh, avoids, avoid black hole, that avoids the singularities and so on and so forth. So I wanted to give you some hints about that. It's it's a complicated topic, but I think um, uh, I can give you some some hints, and also uh, I, I hope to have a nice example that illustrates this uh, this nicely. Um, so let's let, let let us first make a list, and I made it for you uh, about what do we how do we want coordinates in numerical relativity. Well, we want things we want coordinates in such a way things are smooth. Okay. Uh, we don't want shocks or or, uh, or things developing uh, strange because we uh, they are more difficult to deal numerically. Of course, this coordinate they have to avoid singularities. Uh, otherwise, we are in trouble. A computer cannot deal with the singularity. We want them to uh, be well posed, okay, in the sense that when we couple, uh, when we have when we make a choice for them or when, and or when we have the equation for them and we couple this equation to, to, the, to the Einstein system, we want that everything remains well posed if it was before, before the gate choice. Um, and also we want them, um, this is a bit more technical somehow, but uh, if you think about it in terms of these 3D uh, hypersurfaces, you know, they can be bent and this in, in the ambient manifold and distorted as much as we want. This, this in some sense is a gate choice as I try to, to justify. Well, in any case, we, we, we want the coordinate to minimize this grid, this grid distortion, exactly for the same reason that we want smoothness, okay? So in, in, general, in general, in a, on a computer, it's much easier to represent a constant than a complicated varying function. So this is what naively we 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 we, we might want, okay. Um, and <clears throat> the example to to um, to think about to think about uh, coordinate is either you know gravi gravitation collapse um, or or even a single black hole. That that's example of the next uh, of the next slide. Um, and so here, for example, you see you start from a sigma zero, um, and there is in falling matter there is um, uh, there is um, curvature increasing, and you see you can uh, create very um, 
a very large gradient in time, but also in but also in space. Hmm? So in some sense, these coordinates here are, are not very good. Um, so what are examples? Let's uh, first think about um, um, the lapse function, which is, um, as I say, the, 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 the something that controls the proper time of our, of our Eulerian observer. Okay. The easiest thing would be to, 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 to take the lapse function identically equal to one. Uh, this means that your time, your coordinate time of the Eulerian observer, which is what you are numerically integrating, um, what you are numerically following, uh, coincides um, with, uh, um, uh, with geodesics, okay? So T is, is equal to tau in this case. So your Eulerian observer actually follows geodesics. Uh, well, you can clearly see from this, uh, from this picture here on the right, that in this case is, you don't want this <laughs> numeric. There's nothing wrong uh, from, you know, a general activity point of view, but um, you don't want this because geodesics follows, uh, ge geodesics search for a singularity, okay? They're finished inside. Um, so an another choice would be, um, so, so we cross this. Another choice, uh, which is called, for instance, maximal slicing, a very famous one, um, is to leverage on this interpretation here, um, so we discussed before that uh, essentially the, the, the trace of the extrinsic curvature is the expansion of this um, uh, obser uh, Eulerian observer, okay? So we could try to ask this to be zero, okay? This gives you a sort of, if you think about fluids, this is an incompressibility condition for, for Eulerian observer, okay? And, and this is something that turns out to, uh, to, to avoid singularity. Because it, it prevents the bend, this bend, this type of bending. So okay, I have five minutes. I'll, I'll give you an exa a precise example of, of what I'm of what I'm saying. We make a, a ideal simulation or a Gedanken simulation of Svarshild. So this is Svarshild in tau and R star coordinate. Tau is essentially the, um, um, what's it called, the, 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 the uh, yeah, it's, it's geodesic time, okay. <clears throat> R star is a coordinate that uh, uh, R star equals zero is to, is this partial 2M, okay. So in this, uh, in this plot, what you see is essentially the, uh, is, is, the, is essentially the Kruskal diagram in this in this particular coordinate, okay? And in particular, you have uh, here at the center, you have 2M, then there is a line that is the horizon, the, two, uh, the 2M horizon here. I hope you, you see my um, mouse, whatever that is. Um, so this is 2M, this is the horizon. And then you enter inside, you enter the horizon, and this is the last, uh, this is the singularity. Uh, Svarshild radius are equal to zero. And of course, outside, you are outside. Uh, this is the R Svarshild larger than 2M here. And it, uh, all this picture is symmetric, left and right. So I'll present four gauge condition, two on the right and two on the left, and we start on the right. So we start on the right with the simplest slicing condition. So we take alpha equal one and then beta equal zero. Um, and we start our simulation on the space time. And um, what you see in, 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 in red, you can really imagine to be the grid points. Okay, so, so these are your Eulerian observer of your simulation. And these are the grid points on, on your computers. Once you choose uh, geodesic slice, and so once you choose laps identically equal one. So initially you put points here, uh, you're clever enough not to put points exactly at R star equal zero, so you can actually start um, and you go, okay? And you go, you make a first time step, you make a second time step, you make a third time step. That's what you are solving on your computer. So you see that more and more points are entering the horizon. 
and that's you can already imagine that that's not good um but also at the at the fourth time step the very first point that was close to the horizon hit the singularity where does this point hit the, when does this point it hit the singularity around three now you go back to your um well first you check your code millions of time uh, you make all the proofs that your formulation of numerical relativity is correct and it is it's well posed and so on this is only a problem of gauge Okay, so you go back to your uh, general activity class and uh, you check there and you discover that uh, the proper time of uh, a test particle that fall from the horizon to the, to the singularity is pi and this simulation crashes at pi, okay? Um, so this is a gauge that is perfectly fine and everything is perfectly fine. You have the super numerical relativity code, um, but your gauge choice is, is rather poor. And that's why you cannot evolve this spatial solution on the, your computer. <clears throat> so you try another. You, you try something else. Uh, you try to. You don't want to change this this uh, gauge because you don't have a better idea. Um, but you try. Um, you try an, an algorithm <coughs> that um, remove the points uh, from inside the horizon. It's very sophisticated algorithm. Okay, and that's more or less what you get. So by removing points inside the horizon, you have to find the horizon first. So you will use an apparent horizon. Um, uh, and you will remove the points in, inside. If your black hole is moving, this becomes a very, very difficult problem to find the horizon and remove the points from, because it moves from A to B. And then what do you do in A? Um, but you see that the simulation is now successful. So you, you, you have removed the problem here. You have, in this particular case, you have introduced other type of problem, um, but you can continue the simulation further, okay? So this excision technique is what uh, uh, Pretorio has used in his first, um, um, in his breakthrough paper. Um, but let's say you want to take another, another approach. Um, so let's go now on the left part, but it's the same problem. In the left part, now we remember that uh, we remember the meaning of the trace of K, which is the expansion of this Eulerian observer. And we write down an equation for the lapse function. We don't prescribe it anymore, we write an equation. This equation says that the time derivative of the lap lapse function is minus the lapse times K. It means when K becomes large, the time derivative uh, becomes small. Okay, lapse is a positive is a positive quantity. So what this what the solution of this equation is? So you don't know because it's entangled with the, with the complicated nonlinear system of equation. But naively, uh, you, you see that as k become big, um, the time evo the time evolution of the lapse becomes zero. So it's freezing. Okay. So what do you expect from this type of um, equation? From this type of gauge condition? Well, you expect that in the strong region here around r star equals zero, the lapse will stop to evolve, which means the slicing your, hyper, your hypersurfaces will slow down, okay? But far away, of course, that will continue because k is, is more far away in the wave zone, okay? So you expect, wait, okay, so you expect something like that. That is also interesting because you see far away, um, you basically evolve exactly as geodesic slicing, which is basically what you want. Um, but inside here, all the hypersurfaces get uh, squeezed and they don't go beyond because there's no, there's no time evolution as the curvature gets higher and higher and higher, okay? And so that's also a very nice effective way of, um, of choosing the of choosing the um, the gauge okay what could be one problem where well, one problem would would be this slice here that here the and the strong field region the evolution freezes and remains there for for all the time but here on the uh, high on the wave zone the um here it continues to evolve actually the same speed um so you see, you create a very large gradient and eventually this simulation will fail. 
So last, <laughs> uh, we still have uh, freedom. We can still um, use the shift. So this quantity beta here that we have set to zero so far in this experiment, okay? And so let's do it. We can choose carefully, sorry, this is not very clear, but obviously this is only qualitative, but uh, I mean, I have, uh, I can show you data that precisely um, realize this with, with actual equations, correct equations. Um, well, you can, um, you can, you can use your, the freedom that you have in beta in order to minimize this, um, this distortion of this, um, of these hypersurfaces. And uh, you, you don't understand it much from this example, but it, this, this precisely uh, make the game. Um, and and what, you, what you find is that you're actually able to, to evolve this uh, virtually forever. So depending on the resolution, but uh, vir virtually forever. So the, the message is that the clever combination of uh, laps and of gate choices um, uh, actually allows you to to um, to evolve to, to evolve black hole. So this is the um, this last technique that I have just you know sketched is actually called the moving puncture method, and is one of the most robust technique to um, um, to evolve black holes. Uh, but also to handle gravitational collapse. Here you see a real gravitational collapse simulation to a black hole. So this is not a cartoon, it's actually a real simulation. And the, the, the blue the blue grid is actually the uh, equivalent of the spatial coordinate. It's the spatial coordinate uh, calculated from the, from the Eulerian uh, coordinate of, uh, of the simulation. Okay, I think I took more than what uh, I wanted to take you. Um, I had some slide on a few numerical aspects that are particular, but unless people are interested, I, I would um, I would avoid. And uh, yeah, tomorrow uh, I want to discuss a bit more in detail, looking a bit more in detail to some equations, in particular those for the uh, three plus one decomposition, which I think um, yeah, everyone working in, in uh, within general activity or similar uh, should really know and uh, perhaps something on the ADM formulation that, that you know uh, probably and the Cauchy problem. So we will see some of these um, things. Yeah, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. That was uh, very interesting, very logical. We have um, a bit of time for questions. So um, I suggest we go, people raise their hand now. Um, and if you don't have time, then you can write your question. Or if you have more involved questions, write them on Slack. I cannot see any hand raised right now. Um, so write me a message if if you have your hand raised and. I can't see you. Um, in the meantime, I just go on Slack. Yeah, so there's a, a question on Slack, but I think it's a more involved question. I'll let you um, go through that. I can take, uh, I can open Slack, <laughs> Slack and, and yeah, check it out. Uh, yeah, it's a more involved question. So maybe, um, well, we wait for people to formulate the question. I had one quick question, if you don't mind. Um, you showed very nicely at the very beginning, and I'm sure we'll have questions uh, more about the numerical geo, but at the very beginning, you, you showed very nicely how asking for continuity of the waveform, um, Damo and Buenano showed that you get something very similar to the, the actual numerical simulation. Can you um, mention a little bit what is the order of error you would get and, and how do you do the, the continuation? So, so at which order in the to go to the continuation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah I think uh, Alessandro will cover an, um, this aspect. Uh, uh, this is more, uh, you know, more, uh, more, it's a more conceptual comment, at least in this context, there's a more conceptual comment. Um, you, um, 
I, I don't know, but it's it's hard to it's hard to um, if you think about the dissipative process. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, something uh, you know complicated as in the left, as in the left picture. So we, we are still somehow at the you know guessing level, uh, but it's, it's it's difficult to imagine something like that, right? If you have a catastrophic, uh, if you have a catastrophic, uh, um, um, if you have a catastrophic inspiral that certainly would lead a collision, uh, I don't see why there should be this uh, um, minima, for example. Um, so conceptually, what you uh, the continuity is what you ex uh, what I would say one should expect. Uh, because you know you get faster and faster, you, you, the, the, the frequency must uh, must increase, and um, the more it does, the more you emit. Um, so, in, in some sense, this was the comment. So that, that uh, um, you should not take the left picture; you should not take it um, um, qualitatively correct. Um, it, it is certainly an indication for. Uh, you do need supercomputer simulation to have the exact numbers, um, but the way one should really think it, it's probably the right, because of what I said, uh, because of it, it's a dissipative process that can only end, that, you know, can only go in one direction and can only end with uh, um, with this flash, uh, with Dyson flash of uh, burst of. Um, um of gravitational wave and energy and at that point you would definitely create one single black hole and what you expect from one single black hole is that it will wash away it's, it's stable okay and it then it will simply wash away everything else again because of dissipation basically so the yeah um the way to interpret this is that on one hand, what you would expect from a, um, let's say, basic argument is there is the right picture. On the other hand, what this left picture uh, highlight is that in order to capture quantitatively um, this uh, uh, burst, for example, of radiation, this peak or the frequency evolution around that peak, uh, you would definitely need um, supercomputer uh, simulation. And I'm, I'm certain uh, in the next lecture, this will be addressed. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other question? There, there is one by Alex, I see. I see. Henry. Yeah, maybe if you hear me, uh, I could ask a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, I can you hear you. Me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so related to the gauge symmetry, uh, first of all, I wanted to make sure that when you foliated the space time, um, that wasn't any kind of partial gauge fixing yet, right? You, you still had the full freedom of choosing whatever variables you wanted. Uh, yes. Yeah, and uh, but then, so you talk about how you can, uh, Ex, uh, excise all the points uh, inside the horizon or, or not. So I was wondering if that was, uh, well, first of all, if you excise them, that sounds like you still have the full freedom of choosing any kind of coordinates you want. Uh, is that the case for the second uh, thing? The second was sounded more like gauge fixing to me. So when you do the decomposition, you have this, um arbitrary function that uh, naturally merge um, and uh, you carry them over. Uh, but when you arrive at the end um, and you specify, um, you, yeah, you, you do the decomposition of Einstein equations, um, they don't, the Einstein equation do not specify la, uh, alpha and beta. So in that sense, you carry, you carry them over and you have them there and you, you are, not only you are free to choose, you have to choose them if you want to, um, you, if you want to make a, a, a numerical evolution or any application of this equation, you have to make a choice. 
uh, and then I think your question, uh, and it's a free choice. So uh, it is, it decides what uh, um, your Eulerian observer are, it decides what uh, your coordinate are. Um, then I think the question was about this, right? If I yes. Right. Yeah. So on the right hand side, you do the slicing and uh, it, sound, it sounds like you can still have the full freedom of choosing say hormonic coordinates like Pretorius did. Yeah, so what I, what I, what is uh, drawn here um, is uh, uh, in red um, is a particular gate choice. So I'm deciding to put uh, laps identically equal to one in my in my evolution, and I set also this I tell you, but I set also uh, shift equals zero for simplicity. Okay, so this really would follow uh, the geodesics. So at that point, your Eulerian observer are geodesics observers. Um, and in particular, yeah, this, this one that initially is very close to the horizon just fall inside. So at that point, I've made a full choice. OK, so uh, and the other one would be the harmonic coordinate choice. As the, no, the other one, I've, I've been cheating a bit. <laughs> um, no, no, in a, another one in this paradigm of having the slicing. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, this. Um, actually, this. Uh, uh, this one here. So the, the red one on the left. So this 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 um, this equation here dot alpha equal minus alpha k. This is very very close to uh, harmonic age. So it is. Uh, maybe even it is. I. I I don't, there's, there's, I don't remember, I never remember if there's a square somewhere in alpha or k, but uh, this is basically harmonic gauge. So this, what this, um, um, yeah, this is what basically what harmonic gauge does, at least in spirit. Uh, the equation might be not exactly this, but it's a very, very similar equation. If you, if you would express the condition of, um, uh, yeah, of harmonic chord in terms of the laps, um, you would you would find an equation which is very similar to this, and uh, and that and that is what it would happen during the evolution. So you would freeze, you would freeze the evolution of the of the slide of the slides of the slices, sorry, um, as in the areas or in the regions in which curvature is growing more, um, and this is called. A singularity avoidance license. So, in other terms, the harmonic gauge is classified in one of those uh, singularity avoidance license that we use. There are other gauges like this puncture gauge that are very similar, and that's why I always confuse them. Um, that they that they that they have even strong. They are not harmonic, but they are even stronger um, singularity avoid, avoiding um, properties. But in principle, you can always just avoid the singularities by ex excising stuff inside the horizon. Yes. And this, I guess that, so it's it, a numerical technique that, that that point is not gauge anymore or not fully, not only really explicitly depending on gauge. Uh, but doing excision is extremely complicated. Um, and that's the reason I mentioned before. So, um, I mean, if you excise a black hole that is fixed on your grid. Um, okay, you can still do it in the sense that you can calculate the characteristics. Um, you can, and, and based on those, you can decide which point, which points are really um, inside, and which points you should. You should not forget that this is all in three D. But um, um, and but you, in principle, you can do it, right? You you, you check, and you 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 make sure. That you don't use information, uh, you know, from the wrong time. That is actually space, and so on. Or that you don't mix your coordinate because inside here your coordinate. Um, uh, but the moment, so this is already complicated, but it is in principle possible. Uh, many people did it. Um, but you can imagine now when you move the um, the black hole on the grid, and you move it from place A to place B. So. What do you do in the region that you previously excised? Well, I guess you remesh the whole uh, system uh, at every time slice. 
People, I mean, Pretorius did it. <laughs> but but uh, isn't that the most physical thing to do? Because you should never care about what happens inside the, the horizon. That's Sebastian and, and Alex, I'm sorry. I think that's a, that's a very interesting discussion. Um, maybe I would suggest we um, continue the discussion uh, either later today during the open discussion or tomorrow. We just have a few more minutes until the, the next lecture. So yeah, I can simply close that. Uh, it, it is the most natural thing and it is what basically everybody does. Uh, so the two techniques are this moving excision, which is very complicated or um, keeping in, going to a moving coordinate. So keeping, make sure that you have always the black hole in a, in a, in a, in a, in a region of a computational region that you control. Or the third one is what is called natural excision, and that's precisely uh, the blue one. So it's a, it's a way to do excision, but in some sense in a continuum level, but choosing cleverly the gauge. But we can continue on this luck if you're interested. Okay, thank you very much. I, I would suggest we, we thank Sebastiano for now. Thank you. Yep. And then um, I would suggest we take five minutes break um, since we didn't have um, a break during the previous lecture. So we meet at 4.42 <laughs> um, no, in, in five minutes. And Costas, I've seen you have a question, uh, but I've seen you.